Hello and welcome to this special lecture on the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. We're now just past the midway point of this term, and these prophets in particular represent a turning point or a demarcation in our studies of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible from the Orthodox Christian perspective. That up until this point, the Torah, as you will recall, had a destination in mind, that destination being the Promised Land. There would be an exodus from the slavery of Egypt, then slowly they would arrive at the borders of Canaan and Torah. And the whole hope was to arrive at this Promised Land. Ezekiel and Jeremiah talk about what happens after. Well, after, in particular, the Golden Age uh, for the Israelites. Uh, it's arguably the high point of Judaic civilization were the reigns of King David and King Solomon under a united kingdom in the Promised Land. This is everything. Everything that the Torah hoped and wanted was manifested or apparently manifested in these two great kings of a united Israel. There was no, at this point, Northern Kingdom and Southern Kingdom it was just the promised land under the rule of these anointed kings, David and Solomon. And it was the high point of Judaic civilization, arguably, at that time. But it soon fell apart. And it fell apart in stages. And the first stage we're going to focus on in a second. Uh, that's uh, Jeroboam's revolt, which would divide the promised land into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Then this became the start of a disintegration, a collapse. The northern kingdom would fall, the southern kingdom would fall, and the Israelites would be taken into captivity, first by Assyria and the southern kingdom by Babylon. Jeremiah and Ezekiel come into this picture at the last part of this history of where the promised land, that last grains of it, slipped through the fingers of the Israelites. It slowly started breaking away when the kingdom itself broke apart with Jeroboam's revolt. And then over time, we will see the kingdoms strayed. They fell away from God. They started embracing greater Semitic culture of the region and adopted idolatry. And the kingdoms became weak. And the northern kingdom became so weak it was easily conquered by the Assyrians. And a few centuries later, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah would also be conquered. So everything was the promises of God in their hands, manifested under Solomon, slipped away slipped away till nothing was left. And that's where Jeremiah and Ezekiel come in a picture with messages from God to say what has happened, what is happening, and why. And in their messages is a radical element, a radical element about the applicability of the laws of Moses. And how they need to change and how there in fact needs to be a new covenant. So think about that, a new covenant. What's wrong with the old covenant? Those are some of the questions here. These are a bit controversial figures, or at least in the history of Judaism, that they push back against the laws of Moses in some ways. And there was actually quite a bit of debate about whether or not the book of Ezekiel should be included in the Hebrew canon for the Hebrew Bible because he does push back against the Torah and Moses is everything. Well, Moses is awesome, wonderful, not everything. And from the Christian perspective, Jeremiah and Ezekiel really anticipate and pave the way and prepare, prepare the audience for the New Testament, for Christ as a different type of Messiah, not a mil militaristic one, but a different type of Messiah for the true promised land that's not going to be real estate in the Middle East. And these prophets are pushing the cultural understanding of Moses to try to embrace greater 
metaphysical realities rather than the literal letter of the law. So these are key prophets, particularly for the Christian perspective. But to understand them and appreciate them, I want to go over the history leading up to the exile, because the exile and the collapse of the last kingdom of Judah is the narrative landscape in which the prophets will speak and reflect upon. So let's get into that. These next couple of slides take a deep dive into the history of that time, what immediately preceded it and some of what happened afterwards, in order to appreciate the place in salvation history of, a, of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Now let's go back to Jeroboam and his revolt. Why did he revolt? Well, a lot of it was personal ambition, but some of it was political. It was about taxation, the heavy taxes on the northern kingdom, which the people grumbled against, and Jeroboam gave them away to, you know, we don't have to pay these taxes. We can do things our own way. A <laughs> very, uh, very quick loss of that complicated history just stated there. But the breaking apart of the kingdoms to the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel, produced one immediate problem. Jerusalem is in the southern kingdom, and Jerusalem had the Temple of Solomon where you had your experience you had the experience of religion, you had the place for sacrifices, you had the presence of God, so they thought, in the temple itself, in the Holy of Holies. What was the northern kingdom to do? That was a key problem, and one of the solutions was to develop a number of shrines throughout the country, which attempted to do the same thing, but was really not satisfactory. In fact, we will see, or we have seen, in the Book of Kings, that at least the allegation is that, well, the northern kingdom just gave in to idolatry. And whether this is propaganda or this is truth, um, they were not worshiping in Jerusalem temple. And that is a problem, particularly if you have Moses in mind and the whole point of carrying a tabernacle around in the wilderness in order to create the presence of God in an actual temple in Jerusalem they're actually excluded from that. So they had to do something. And so they built a number of shrines. And we actually see in the Hebrew Bible, in the Book of Kings, these shrines reportedly, underscore reportedly, just gave in to the idolatry of the surrounding pagan uh, tribes and kingdoms. That, in fact, reportedly they had golden calves which is extraordinary they worship actual idols of golden calves just like the one that was destroyed outside mount sinai when moses turned his back this if they were actual golden calves perhaps as a callback to an egyptian fertility god goddess hathor and imagine the abandoning of everything moses was here they are, hundreds of years later. Moses perhaps had faded away into, you know, folklore or fairy tale. It wasn't as real to their lives as the realness of, well, we have to deal with the Philistines and we're trading with them, we're trading goods, and our cultures are mixing with the other tribes of Moab, and everyone has their own gods, and they just kind of perhaps embrace that idolatry. And that is what's recorded in the Old Testament. They gave themselves into idolatry. Now, the narrative is this weakened them to the point that the Neo-Assyrian Empire very readily went in and just smashed the Northern Kingdom and took every Jew they could capture and ethnically cleansed the region. You know, they wanted it for their own, so they took every person they could find and brought them back to Assyria and broke them apart uh, and created a situation where the people just faded into history. After one or two generations of exile, they were indistingu indistinguishable from the Assyrians themselves. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel disappeared through intermarriage, just through cultural laxness, through just forgetting. Ten of the ten twelve tribes disappeared by the Assyrians. 
What's interesting part of the story from a Christian perspective is the Assyrians didn't capture everyone when they conquered. A lot of people hid in the mountains and just hid and were able to survive in the region. In time, these people would be known as the Samaritans, which is a very familiar name in the New Testament times. And this sets the stage for understanding why do the Jews and the Samaritans of the first century Palestine really hate each other? It's because of this ancestral memory that the Jews probably looked at the Samaritans, well, you know, you were the cowards that hid in the mountains and were probably given over to idolatry, you know, while the rest of our kinsfolk were taken to Syria and disappeared, that there was something very suspect about and resentful about the way the Jews looked at the Samaritans, the surviving remnants of the northern kingdom that no longer had access to Jerusalem, so they had a different mountain they worshipped on. So that's a little bit of the back history there. Well, the southern kingdom held out for a couple of more centuries, but then a new big bad guy on the block appeared, not the Assyrians this time, but the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And I'll talk about this on the next stage, and they will come in and eventually conquer Judah. This is what immediately preceded the fall of the southern kingdom. A new empire arose in Babylon, led by Nebuchadnezzar. And they were fearful, they were strong, they were powerful, such that a most amazing thing happened in history, that everyone in the region realized this guy is a problem, and even though we all hate each other, we need to get together and try to defeat the greater of the, all the evils. And so Egypt, the Assyrians, and Judah all form an alliance to battle the Babylonians in 605 of the Before Common Era. And it's just fascinating. Well, you know, the history of Judah and Egypt, well, a long time ago you guys enslaved us, uh, but that was 600 years before. And so in the political setting of the time, it's like, no, Egypt, the Assyrians, Judah, we've all fought each other before. We have to fight the Babylonians. So they get together, and the Babylonians crushed them. They crushed them at this famous battle. And in fact, the Babylonians then continued, destroyed the Assyrians, went down the coast, and eventually the Egyptians just barely held out. They held them out, and Egypt survived, but everything in the region was crushed. And the feat was such that uh, King Zechadiah, of Judah changed sides halfway throughout and begged, you know, hey, let us live and we'll obey Babylon. And he did this at first, Babylon agreed, but later he's, he's like, it's not really tolerable to be a client kingdom to Babylon. You're not really free. You're paying taxes to Babylon. So King Zechadiah would lead a revolt, this time banding together with Egypt once again to try to throw off the Babylonian yoke. Well, this had a number of repercussions. One, it angered the Babylonians to the point of, one, we're going to destroy the temple, depopulate all of Judah, take you all into captivity. And King Zechadiah had the worst face of all. They captured him, made him witness them killing his sons, and then blinded him. So the last thing he saw was the death of his children. Then he spent the rest of his years in captivity, blind in Babylon. He was a descendant of King David. So this is a huge issue. But he had a nephew who was also taken to captivity and would be released 37 years later. So the Davidic line was barely preserved. And the Davidic line is very important with respect to uh, Judaic and Christian understanding of salvation history. So we're going to get into that uh, next, but a closer look of the two exiles, I give a breakdown on the next slide. So putting this uh, complex history in a little bit of an easier overview, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. This land had been originally settled by the 12 tribes of Israel. They re reportedly embraced idolatry and God withdrew his protection. And this allowed the Assyrians to take the people into captivity. 
relocate them to Assyrian lands and the people would just disappear through a couple of generations, intermarriage, new customs. They forgot what it meant to be Jews. These are the 10 lost tribes. The ones that were able to evade capture and hid out in the mountains would become the Samaritans uh, in the New Testament. Then a new empire emerges, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Now they would conquer the southern kingdom in 597, but then there was a second revolt led by King Zechariah, which I just described, and then they entirely destroyed, they were so angry at this, they destroyed everything, took all the people into captivity, but they were not as cruel as the Assyrians. The Jews taken to Babylon were allowed to still be Jews. They lived in their own communities. Life wasn't that terrible for being prisoners in another land compared to what the Assyrians did. In fact, some of the Jews, once they had a chance to return uh, to the promised land, some stayed in Babylon and it became a vibrant, rich Jewish community that eventually would produce the ba Babylonian Talmud. So it became a Jewish center. It wasn't that bad under the Babylonians, though still bad. And some of the Jewish people after the conquest, well, they didn't have the option of just hiding out in the mountains. They ran to Egypt for protection and actually dragged uh, Jeremiah with them. In, even though he didn't want to, they forced him to go. Now, just a historical note that we know there was a Jewish population center in Egypt, in Alexandria in Egypt. These aren't those Jews of that time that the Jewish settlement of Alexandria dates to the Hellenistic period, to Ptolemy uh, in particular, which, you know, allowed for a vibrant, rich Jewish center to appear in Alexandria, which eventually produced our very own Septuagint. But the original Jews that fled the conquest of Judah back in King Zechariah's time, well, they don't appear to be the same Jews. If any of them survived, they appear to have faded into history at all you know, uh, completely. So it's just the Jews in the Babylon that is the remnant of everything that represented God's promises to Abraham are surviving as a captive people in a foreign land. And on the next slide, we're going to talk about the hopes of the promises of Abraham eventually realized in King David in this Davidic line. What happened to that? The messianic line of King David was preserved in this nephew, King Jehoiakim. Now, he was also taken prisoner. He would eventually be released, and when he returned to Judah, he would have become king. But there's an interesting prophecy recording in Jeremiah regarding this man. And here are the words from Jeremiah 22. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless. That's Jehoiakim. A man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Now, in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus traces his lineage back to this guy. This guy who Jeremiah said is cursed before the Lord and will not rule on the throne of King David. Well, this is the drama of the New Testament, that at that time of history, the Jewish lands, the promised lands, Palestine, was under Roman rule. And this was not tolerable because the Roman Empire had lots of idolatry all over the place and the Jews hated the Romans because they were defiling the Holy Land with the presence of all these idols. And they wanted a Messiah. And the Messiahs in the time of David and the time of Solomon, if we go back to the deliverers in the book of Judges, all the people who'd rise up to save the people did it with arms in their hand. They were military leaders, military commanders that were able to summon up the people, start a revolt, and with God's help, overthrow whoever was oppressing the Jews at that time. So... During the Roman occupation, everyone wanted a Messiah with a sword in the hand to conquer the idolatrous Romans and reclaim the land promised to them by God. 
this is not what Jesus did. He is a different type of king. He's a king of kings. He is the Lord God. It is a promised kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is a different type of reality than the political dynamics of either this time in the history or the time of history of first century Palestine where they wanted uh, King David. So these verses from Jeremiah you know, are saying the line of David will no longer be a military commander sitting on the throne of David. Uh, Jesus Christ did not, you know, you know, assume that type of kingdom. He did not want that power. It was not his mission. So it's interesting. This is embedded in Jeremiah that all your entire history has taught you, Jews, all you Israelites, that the promised land comes through conquest and the sword. Don't look to the line of David for that type of Messiah. Now, more clues about the Messiah will be found later on, but there's more history here I want to get into before we get into Jeremiah and Ezekiel fully. So the Jews suffer conquest, capture, and relocation of Babylon. Approximately 50 years later, King uh, Queen Esther would arise and, you know, being a Jew who had became a queen, freed her people and allowed them return in 538 before a common era. And the Jews were allowed to return. King Cyrus obeyed his queen and said, you can go back. That is entirely fine. But you're a client kingdom. I'm really the king. You're more like a governor king of a particular region and you pay me lots of taxes and everything is good. And that's how things would operate. Jews were allowed to return, but it was never, never like it was under King David or King Solomon. You're never really free. And that's the history of the Jews after the return. They never quite get back to that place in history under King David and King Solomon. First, they were a client kingdom under Persian rule. Uh, for a couple of hundred years. And then Alexander the Great comes and he conquers Persia and along the way. Uh, he goes through, um, through Palestine. And this is the beginning of the Hellenistic period of Judaism, a very important period. The language of the New Testament is Greek. That is because of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great did not just bring language. He also brought everything with him, with Greek culture, including the philosophers. Alexander the Great was taught by Aristotle. And so the richness of philosophy and Greek culture, it was all became woven into the fabric and merged and synergized with Judaic experience. And in fact, even just before and during the time of Jesus, there were famous rabbis who were also philosophers in the Greek traditions. Philo the Jew, Philo of Alexandria is perhaps the better way to, to refer to him, was a rabbi and a philosopher and he expressed the truths of Judaism through a philosophical lens. Now, this is what Christianity would do as well. And I'm gonna to return to this point uh, in the next slide and then at the end of the lecture, because this is important, and I think this is very integral to the Christian experience. Once the Jews returned from Babylon, there was an incubation period and Hellenistic culture that preceded the birth and the incarnation of Christ into a Judaic Greek world such that Christ could become the Logos of God. Logos is a Greek word. And it's a Greek word with a lot of philosophical meaning and import. And particularly Orthodox Christians, of all the Christians, really embrace this philosophical aspect of theology that the Hellenistic period, that was necessary. 
it was necessary to ingrain that in the culture in order for Christ to appear and express himself in Greek ways. Particularly the Apostle Paul, he would show up in Athens and enter into a philosophical debate with Greek philosophers in Athens, Greece. It's a Greek world for the Jews of the first century Palestine, and this is a very important part of history. But near the end of the Hellenistic rule, the Jews have a civil war between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and allowed for the Romans to come in and just sweep up the remains and put under very tyrannical Roman rule, which the Jews really hated. But this sets the stage, but I want to talk about this Hellenistic period of Judaism and how that's rather pivotal, pivotal pivotal to understand Orthodox Christian experience. Orthodox Christian experience in Western culture can at times be very confusing because of certain biases and prejudices introduced by Catholic and Protestant understandings of the Christian faith. Here is one that's going to tie together with the earlier discussion and discussion at the end of today's lecture. It is a bias introduced by the Catholic figure, the Church Father, Tertullian. Now, he's not a saint of orthodoxy for a number of reasons, and even Catholics, uh, Tertullian ended his life as a heretic, so he's an important figure and the development of theology, but I'm not unsure of his place today. I've actually heard a professor describe Tertullian as sort of a crazy uncle that lives in the attic. You know, they rather, Catholics rather talk about Augustine and Aquinas, you know, Tertullian's living in the attic and they don't really want to talk about him. But where he is talked about today is this idea of Jews. What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? And what that means is you have the faith of the church or you have the academy, the academy of science. And in, in that day, philosophy and science were the same thing. But it, today, when they bring up Tertullian, no, no, you have to choose. What does the academy have to do with the faith of the church born in Jerusalem? Is there, how can they be compatible? And Tertullian says all heresies begin with philosophical academic questions about the faith. I'll read this quote, just so you can appreciate the venom in which he wrote. These are the doctrines of men and of demons, produced for itching ears of the spirit of this world's wisdom. You know, this is all the stuff coming out of Plato's Academy. This the Lord calls foolishness, and choose the foolish things of the world to confound even philosophy itself. For philosophy... It is which the material of the world it is the material of the world's wisdom, the rash interpreter of the nature and dispensation of God. Everything Tertullian's writing here is philosophy is just terrible to apply to theology. Indeed, heresies are themselves instigated by philosophy. What indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church? What between heretics and Christians? Our instruction comes from the porch of Solomon, who himself taught that the Lord should be taught in the simplicity of heart. The porch of Solomon rather than Aristotle's porch. So he's saying choose salvation or condemnation and death. And you have to either choose the church or you choose the philosophical sciences of ancient Greece. Or if you're carrying it forward today, choose religion or choose secular science. That dynamic, that faith versus science diatribe that happens with such venom and such confusion for Orthodox Christians today in Western media have their origin in Tertullian here. He's not an Orthodox saint. The Orthodox would embrace philosophy in the proper way. That, in the words of Clement of Alexandria, philosophy is the handmaid to theology. It beautifies theology. Theology is a mystery, but around the mystery you can have understanding attached to faith. What is happening during the divine liturgy? If you have that understanding, you can be at liturgy and be more present. They can work together. And the whole history of orthodox theology is using 
that proper amount and ways of using philosophy in order to make theology intelligible, appreciable, understanding, even more glorious. Gregory of Nyssa compares philosophy to the gold that would become the altars for the Holy of Holies, for the Ark of the Covenant, for the gold that surrounds and inframes a mystery. They work together. But the ancient world, you know, in the Western experience says, no, either you have blind faith or you have understanding, and that's a secular road that's going to lead you to damnation. That is not the orthodox way. Now, this is a point I'm going to revisit at the end of the lecture, but it ties back to, to give you a hint, a pretty obvious hint, that before Christ was incarnated in the first century, at the beginning of the first century, there was this Hellenistic period of Judaism where Greek philosophical culture and Judaic theology mixed and came together to achieve something that the Christians would embrace at that time. Now, I guess one other thing to introduce here came into discussion on class on Thursday. The Protestants particularly have adopted, you know, unironically, Tertullian here, that the Protestants have academically uh, and figures like Albert Schweitzer and Adolf von Harnack had been searching for the true original faith of the historical Jesus before the faith became Hellenized. Hellenized means to become Greek. And in that context, it means become embracing Greek metaphysical philosophy. And so they have this imagination that Christ lived in a world of pure late Second Temple Judaism experience and that there was nothing Greek about it. And that if the Protestants can get back to that, they can erase all Catholic influence of understanding of theology and be entirely Protestant. And that's their fight they fight with the Catholics, to demythologize and de-Hellenize theology to understand the true original Jesus before the church made it Greek. That's this entire battle against Hellenism. Well, Hellenism was there way before even Christ entered the scene with the Incarnation. It was part of the Judaic experience after the exile. So from an Orthodox Christian perspective, this Protestant quest to find the original faith of Christ before it became Greek in later uh, theology is imaginary. It's finding unicorns and snarks, things that don't exist. Christ was already born into a Greek world. We know he used Greek words uh, in the New Testament. He called the Pharisees hypocrites at one point. Well, hypocrite's a Greek word. There's no parallels in Aramaic or Hebrew for that word. That word actually means actor. What is a hypocrite? He's someone who pretends someone they're not. That's what an actor is. They pretend to be Romeo. They pretend to be Juliet or, you know, whoever the Greek figures were. So it's actually a rather wry comment for Christ to say, you Pharisees, you're like those Greek actors. You put on masks, you go on a stage, you play a role, but that's not who you really are, you know, beneath the skin in your heart of hearts. You are not true priests. You are not really worshiping Yahweh the right way. So Greek uh, Christ was born into a very Hellenized world, and there was no Christianity before Hellenism because it was already there. So a lot of history here, and it'll all come together. But uh, while I had your ear, I wanted to make sure you know a little bit of the full picture. So now we're ready to begin talking about these two very key prophets, the prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Ezekiel. Now, they coincide in history. Their time frames line up. But Ezekiel would begin his ministry after becoming a captive in Babylon. That's when his story picks up. And it picks up after Jeremiah his end. He is the prophet of the last five kings of Judah. So it's a 40-year ministry. He sees the death of the kingdom. And Ezekiel picks up the story when captive in Babylon, and there's much more hope in that story. So they really complement each other. They work together. And another interesting thing about the text, 
that Jeremiah is said to have been inspired by the word of God. And that is in the Hebrew text. The Hebrew word for word is there. Well, Ezekiel is inspired by the spirit of God, a different word. And from Christian experience, the word and the spirit of God, you're speaking our language. The word means Christ, logos uh, in Greek, the word of God. And the spirit is very much associated with the wisdom of God. And we, I think it's very useful to see their prophecies and their ministries kind of reflecting these expressions of the ineffable reality and totality of God in particular ways. That Jeremiah is much more comp complete, real, present, and has a clarity and a precision that perhaps, perhaps reflects the Logos. Ezekiel is mystical. He's overwhelmed by the incomprehensibility, the ineffability of the divine experience of God, and he struggles with his language to try to give you something of what he saw. And in many ways, it is him being overwhelmed by the fullness of the Spirit of God and then trying to find the words to express it. That's why another reason these two prophets are complementary. If you want a full picture of God and the prophecy, the word and the wisdom of God need to be appreciated together. And so they're very interesting prophets in order to compare side by side, which is what we do in our lecture. It is undoubtedly the case that no prophet look upon their ministry with joy, that they were called to be prophets in order to preach a message of repentance. And it's the fate of the prophets that mostly they were laughed at and ignored. And so in many ways, it's a, it's a terrible burden, a necessary burden to be called to being a prophet. And this is perhaps really revealed clearly and poignantly in the prophet Jeremiah, who's also known as the weeping prophet. He had a long ministry. He was called to witness the death of Judah. The last five kings, he saw it and he preached against it. And King Josiah listened to him, but no one else did. And so his entire experience is, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to see the death of Jerusalem and of the temple. And no one's listening to me. And we get a feeling for his pain. His ministry started in his youth and it lasted 40 years. And in his epistles, he will ache in his heart for what is happening. And he will even complain to God. And he's a very real, personal prophet in this way because he struggles. He struggles in a very human way that I think many of us can appreciate and sometimes feel that God is there. He's going to watch over Jeremiah. He's going to protect Jeremiah. But sometimes he doesn't feel it. He knows God's there, but he has to suffer watching terrible things, the death of Judah. But he has a message. He has a message for them and a message for us. But he's a very powerful figure and a very much a figure that speaks with a voice that can be heard with a realness today that a few writers from this time can do. Perhaps because he's inspired by the word of God, his words really echo today with a life and a vibrance that few others do. The book of Jeremiah is also remarkable for the inconsiderable amount of detail it gives about the life of Jeremiah himself through his personal scribe, Baruch. And so we know a lot about him, and I think his biography really adds weight to his prophecy. He's the son of a priest and a, of a lineage that traces all the way back to Moses, that really key figure. And so... His prophecies, as I mentioned before, are a turning point and demarcation for understanding of Moses. He's the person, the right person to do this. He's not just someone off the street. 
He's someone with authority. He begins in Josiah's reign, Josiah the Reformer, and that's when his prophecy is heard. And Josiah will rip his robe and cry and when he finds the book of Deuteronomy and everything Jeremiah had preached to him, it is there. And he realizes Judah has gone astray with idolatry and they need to reform. Unfortunately, Jeremiah's own son, the next king, disregarded everything, reversed everything, went back to idolatry because that's the reality of the world he lived in. You got to deal with the Palestines, you got to deal with Moab, got to deal with um, the Assyrians, and everyone has their gods and trades. It's just kind of all the same, isn't it? Sort of a um, an ancient commentary of interfaith zeal. All religions are not the same, and you just can't mix them at like you like. And so Jeremiah would witness this with gloom and doom, with a message of repentance that after Josiah, no one would hear. So let's get into some details about his book, now that we know a little bit about him. There's a touching detail at the start of the book where God appears to Jeremiah in a most unusual theophany as an almond branch. Almond is a tree, produces a fruit, and the seed of that fruit are the almonds that we eat, are the nuts. But he appears, God appears as an almond branch, which is a very curious thing for God to appear as. You can understand what that means because the Hebrew word for almond is phonetically close to the idea of watch to uh, to watch so God appearing as an almond branch uh, shaked is almost like shakad that God was saying I'm appearing to you I'm gonna watch over you your life and a branch to cover over kind of protect now that's a very beautiful reassuring image because his ministry would need that protection because uh, God demanded a lot of him, one of which was to remain celibate, which was uncommon at the time and factored into people rejecting him. It's like, why would you do this? And he seemed like a crazy person. Why remain celibate? Well, it was part of enacted prophecy, something Ezekiel would do a lot more. But he remained celibate as a symbolic statement of Judah's barrenness and God's judgment over Judah, the kingdom of Judah, that nothing will come of it. Nothing will grow here. Nothing will emerge from this because it is desolate. It is abandoned God, it is in based idolatry. So you love the temple of Solomon and you love this kingdom of the promised land. It's going to be taken away. Now, because of Jeremiah's preaching against the common wisdom of the day, in Judah's experience, everything was fine. And he's saying, oh, you have abandoned God, but Moses was like 600 years earlier. 600 years ago, you know, sort of a mythological figure in people's imagination. So they plotted to kill him. And there was many plots to against him. Very interestingly, Jeremiah would preach that the Temple of Solomon would be destroyed. The Temple of Solomon was what housed at the center of the Temple of Solomon is the Holy of Holies. That is where the Ark of the Covenant is, and the throne of God, and the presence of God, God's self, is there. And so an attack upon the temple, even rhetorically, is, was seen as an attack upon God, as, under, as an attack upon God's very throne, a, some, a symbol of his power and authority in the world. So preaching the destruction of the temple is like destroying the throne of the king, as making God homeless if you destroy the temple. So that's the most outrageous thing you could possibly say during First Temple Judaism. Jesus, too, would prophesy the destruction of the second temple that would be created, the one that Herod completed, and the people at that time freaked out when he did it. And in fact, when Stephen, Stephen the martyr, repeated the words of Jesus, he was charged for blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy against God, against the throne of God for preaching the destruction of the temple, and he would be killed for this. So that drama in the New Testament is foreshadowed here in Jeremiah saying, you've abandoned God, the temple's going to be taken away from you. 
and they're still pretending to honor God, thinking that's blasphemy. No, that is God's judgment. You don't deserve this. I'm God's going to take take it away. God giveth, and God taketh it away. And other plots here, Jeremiah was thrown into stocks and famously thrown into a well. You know, to basically just starve and die at the bottom of an abandoned cistern. So we're going to return to that part of the story a little bit later. But details about his life here and about his very hard ministry. Another complicating factor for his ministry, it's not just that the people wouldn't listen to Jeremiah. There are plenty other false prophets saying everything's fine, everything's great. And for people who you know, wondering who to trust, well, confirmation bias, they trusted the false prophets instead of Jeremiah because the false prophets were saying, you are great. And are you gonna, are you gonna argue with someone who's saying you're great? Jeremiah is the one who's saying, repent, repent, repent. So they just go, ah, forget about this guy. So the false prophets, Jeremiah will write about them. The worst false prophets was this guy, Hananiah. But speaking about them all, Jeremiah 23, verse 14. Also, I have seen a horrible thing in the prophets, or the false prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They also strengthen the hands of the evildoers by telling them everything's fine. So that no one turns back from his wickedness. He's preaching repentance and no one will repent because every all these other false prophets are saying, you guys are great, don't do anything wrong. And because of this, he says, all of them are like Sodom to me. Their inhabitants are like Gomorrah, people who have abandoned God and only embrace the things of this world and given over to the harlotry of idolatry. Idolatry is associated with cheating on God with other goddesses from other cultures. So the idea of Sodom and Gomorrah are very stinging criticisms of people enjoying business as usual when in reality the world was actually coming to an end for the kingdom of Judah. So Jeremiah's personality, I really think adds to an appreciation of the importance of his message and the realness of him as a human being, as a human being without, he's inspired by God, but he's still flesh and blood. And he emotionally reacts to this terrible ministry of a prophecy of repentance to people who will not rep repent at all. And so here's some touching words from him himself about what it felt like to be a prophet at that time. O oh Lord, you induced me and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily and everyone mocks me so he's like I didn't want to be a prophet God induced him yes you're gonna say yes to God God's stronger than him making him walk this path and yet he's terribly terribly in pain and lonely because of this terrible burden that he has and in fact we actually see another touching aspect of his personality in the next slide where we'll actually complain against God, but God is allowing him to do this. Be honest with your emotions. Say what you need to say. I will still watch over you. I am the almond branch. So he's very honest here about what he feels like. Sometimes he felt like God had abandoned him because people would not listen. So in Jeremiah 15, I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because of God's hand. For you have filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual, my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream as waters that fail? Often he felt abandoned by God. God was there, but he did not always feel God's presence. I think that's a touching, 
touching story for us today that sometimes feel that way. But the truth is God is there. God does care for Jeremiah. And we'll see that in the next, next slide. Complaining against God is not blasphemy, as long as you don't go too far. You can be honest with your emotions, and you can reach out God to, to God with your pain and give it voice. And God here responds. And so let's read this verse where God listens to Jeremiah. Okay, I, I hear you. Then God says, then the Lord says to Jeremiah, if you return, then I will bring you back. If you stand before me, if you take out the precious from the vile, you shall be as my mouth, the word of God. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them, that is the vile. And I'll make you to this people a fortified bronze wall, and they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. So it's about your ministry. Jeremiah, you complained, repent, and I will bring you back, and you will stand before me. If you take out what is precious from what is vile, you grumbled against me. Let's leave that part out. Let's not continue with that. Then you shall be an instrument of the word of God. You will be my mouth. And preach repentance. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. You know, you're calling for repentance. They need to come to you. You don't grovel before them. And God will protect Jeremiah like a fortified bronze wall. They will fight against you, but not prevail, for God will save Jeremiah. So we're getting insight here of communication, of back and forth. You can dialogue with God, even with your pain sometimes. As long as you don't go too far, and as long as you return back to God, say your peace, then let the vile go, and accept God's providential care. There's a message here, and I'm going to talk about it later in the term when we get to the book of Job, of you can be real and honest with God with the evil you've suffered in your life. So you turn back to God, let go of the vile from the precious, which is the word of God. God will embrace you. And this is part of the journey, part of Jeremiah's journey, perhaps part of your journey. And we'll see it as part of Job's journey and Jonah as well, as, as well. I'm <laughs> quite a Freudian slip there, as well. And we'll talk about how you can dialogue with God through your pain and in order to find God again if you've lost your way. That's for a future lecture. But here with Jeremiah, we see it anticipated, the discussion of, you can be honest with God, but turn back to God, and God will take you back into his care and watch over you. So what was the crisis that precipitated the need for Jeremiah to become a prophet and to preach repentance to the people. Undoubtedly, it was a whole host of many betrayals of God and laws of Moses. But the big one and the catch-all catch term to everything terrible you're doing is really manifested in this really bad thing that you're doing called idolatry. You embraced other gods. And amazing words here, again, this clarity, the word of God about what was happening, that uh, in idolatry, you know, what is it they're doing? They're worshiping these other gods? Quoting now Jeremiah 2. Has a nation changed its gods which are not gods? There's only one true God in the Judaic experience. Yahweh, I am. That's meaning the truly existing one, the source of all life, the source of all creation, is God. All these other idols are just metal and stone. They're not gods. Has a nation changed its gods which... Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, Yahweh, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. The wa You know, very much New Testament language here. 
Christ talks about living waters, that if you drink of them, you'll have everlasting life. Life, the source of life, is Yahweh, is God. But the people have surrendered God, the fountains of living waters, for empty idols that contain nothing. They've become desolate. This is why Jerusalem had to be destroyed in God's eyes. Why the temple had to be destroyed because it was empty of all true reverence. And a huge change will happen in Judaic experience where God is not con confined to stone walls. He doesn't reside, you know, you know, in the throne room of the inner sanctuary, in the mercy seat of the Holy of Holies. God is a God of the entire world. He's not confined. He travels the earth. This will be Ezekiel's message. But it's being anticipated here in Jeremiah that everything's become desolate. God's going to take it away in order to create a necessary evolution in thought about how the people thought about God. God is not just a God of Canaan. He's a God of the entire world. And the people who are trading with the other people of the region just thought it's all kind of the same and idolatry is not a big deal. It is. Now, in these uh, prophecies of gloom and doom about the coming destruction of Judah and the kingdom, we should also remember he, there were some people who listened. Uh, he did have some friends, and they're actually important to the story. In fact, there's some... Um, interesting details here which even theologically I don't know if we really appreciate exactly what's happening here we do know he had a personal scribe throughout his life Baruch uh, there was another priest and prophet at the time who would write the book of Zapania. he's one of the minor prophets he was on his side of course <laughs> you know both serving Yahweh King Zachariah at first listens uh, to Jeremiah but then becomes afraid and does some terrible things and abandons Jeremiah and embraces pagan gods. Uh, there's a prince of Judah who dared to protect Jeremiah, but the really interesting one, there's an Ethiopian official who saves Jeremiah from death in the well. Now what's interesting about this Ethiopian official is that the name given for him in the book of Jeremiah is really a job title, it means servant to the king. Ethiopian, and he's also identified as a eunuch, we have heard this before in the New Testament, that there's something about this narrative which is repeated as antitype in the New Testament. We know Philip the Evangelist would convert and baptize an unnamed Ethiopian official who happened to be a eunuch as well in Acts 8. And then Philip then has a rapture experience and is teleported somewhere else. Ezekiel has a lot of raptures and is moving all around, uh, all around the world, from Babylon back to Jerusalem and around. So there's something about that narrative that connects with what's happening in the book of Jeremiah, all these New Testament stories. And what it could be, and this is your professor speculating, that one of the great mysteries is that the destruction of the Temple of Solomon, it contained the Ark of the Covenant that Moses had. What happened to it, historically speaking? Was it captured? Was it destroyed? Did uh, the, the last priest uh, hide it somewhere on the Temple Mount that still hasn't been found? Well, there's a legend that the Ark of the Covenant was taken to Ethiopia for its protection. And in fact, the Ethiopian... Uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church says it has the Ark of the Covenant in a church in Aksum. And it's because of this historical connection that Ethiopia, you know, had a Jewish community that dates back to the Queen of Sheba, you know, to the time of Solomon. And so it could very well be that these texts in the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible is showing clues about you know, don't worry about this stuff because it is, in fact, in Ethiopia. It's sort of confirm if you take that Ethiopian point of view, there's some um, confirmation here in the narratives that, yeah, they definitely had a way to preserve what is precious from the temple and take it to another land for its protection. 
But surprisingly, there hasn't been a lot written about this Ethiopian official, theologically speaking, that I've discovered in my research. So it's all speculation on professor's part, but there's no coincidence in these biblical stories. The fact we have an Ethiopian eunuch with a job title who saves Jeremiah, it's very interesting that Philip the Evangelist will save and baptize an Ethiopian official in Acts 8. Something's happening there between Judah and Ethiopia, theologically speaking. Jeremiah would tell King Zacchaeus to surrender, which is the most counterintuitive thing you could imagine in Judaic experience. With God's help, the Jews were able to conquer stronger peoples when they entered in the Promised Land. They conquered Jericho, they conquered you know, the city of Ai, they conquered everyone because they had God on their side. And now Jeremiah is saying to the king, surrender? It's because God is not interested in protecting idolatrous Jerusalem anymore. So Jeremiah has a hard truth to tell King Zechariah. Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live. The city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. Surrender to a foreign nation. Jeremiah is a prophet to the nations, plural, not just to the Jews. There's an implication here that God is working through other nations to achieve what God wants. So Babylon is an agent of God's justice. So don't oppose God's justice because God is coming in to punish Jerusalem for its idolatry. Do not resist God in the form of Babylon. This was a truth too much for King Zacchaeus. He could not accept that. And so Jeremiah concludes with the next verse, But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given to the hands of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape their hand. This is what happened. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. King Zechariah was captured, his sons were murdered before his eyes, and his seed came to an end. The seed of David would continue in a nephew, but for him himself, his line, his immediate family line, died. Because he could not hear the hard truth that Jeremiah was preaching. Zechariah heard these words from Jeremiah and just could not accept him. And in fact, what he did was, in modern parlance, would be to double down on heresy. Now, if he's going to be abandoned by God, he'll just turn to another God, which is an astounding response here in Jeremiah 44. And these are Zechariah's words. But, but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings to her. The Queen of Heaven here is not the Theotokos. It is some sort of pagan god, an idol of the surrounding regions, possibly Ishtar. The Orthodox Study Bible would identify this particular pagan goddess as Ishtar. And he says, you know what? If, if you're always going to abandon us, we're going to just embrace idolatry fully. Because you'll remark here, when we did this in the past, admitting to his idolatry, we had plenty of food, were well off, and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and been consumed by sword and famine. So Zagadiah is saying, you know what? You're preaching against idolatry, but idolatry seemed to work. It worked in relationship to what we wanted from this world which was peace and prosperity and plenty of everything, but Yahweh, you know, Yahweh doesn't do this, you know. So they're not associating God is removing his providential care because they embraced idolatry. They just see idolatry as, you know what, that seemed to work in the past. Let's try it again. Guess what? It doesn't work. Now, just a note here, throughout this lecture, I'm using the New King James Version for my scriptural references. The Orthodox Study Bible mixes. They use the Septuagint, 
but they add to it at times in order to form a more complete picture. The Septuagint ver version, though, is different than the Jewish texts that would be received later in history, the Masoretic texts. The Septuagint is a bit shorter, one-seventh shorter, and the passages are numbered differently. So occasionally, the actual scripture, chapter, and verses do not line up between the New King James Version and what the Orthodox Study Bible has. So this particular passage, I have a note that if you want to look it up for yourself, actually appears in chapter 51, verses 17 through 18. So unfortunately, I don't have the Orthodox Study Bible online such that I can make a nice screen grab and create a beautiful slide out of it. So I'm doing the that with the New King James Version, but if you're going back to the Orthodox Study Bible, and that's the Bible you're using, you'll have to search for where these passages appear. Yeah, I wanted to note it here. Sorry, it couldn't be helped in preparing this lecture. There is a message of hope in the book of Jeremiah. And, but it's hope you will find with a twist. But first the hope, and again here is symbolic action, enacted prophecy, something Ezekiel will do a lot more, but it's here in Jeremiah too. So Jeremiah, in the midst of a siege of Babylon and preaching that God's going to destroy everything, does something bizarre to the eyes of the people. He buys, he buys a deed to a piece of land. What you imagine, a city under siege, I want to buy you know, your home and your territory, that's very much, yeah, take it. <laughs> it's going to be worthless in about 10 days when the Babylonians get here. So whatever you want to give me for money, you can take it. So it was a very easy thing to do to buy a piece of land, but this is what he does. Then I charge Baruch before them, saying, so before the people, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, these deeds to the land that he just bought, both this purchase deed, which is sealed, and this deed which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the house and the fields and the vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. So he's going to take these deeds, you know, I'm bought in this land that's about to be conquered by a foreign army who has no interest in allowing us to stay here, and I'm going to bury it in the earth, because I'm coming back. We are coming back. We're going to come back to the promised land in time. So it's an astounding event that undoubt the people go, you're just crazy. You bought land that's going to be conquered by foreign armies. And you're saying, we're going to, you're going to come back someday and enjoy this piece of land. So it's a powerful statement of trust and faith in the Lord that this punishment is not final. This punishment is to teach a lesson to do certain things, but you still have a story to evolve. The story of the Israelites will continue in the promised land. You will come back. And in fact, we do know there is going to be simple, Second Temple Judaism, which will eventually lead to the New Testament. So the story does not end with the conquest of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple. It's only midway through the story. There's still hope. Now this hope comes with a twist. And here's that demarcation. Here is that evolution in thought that the covenant under Moses needs to grow and change. Because the people are continuing to be idolatrous, the people will need a new beginning. The story of covenant is a story of relationship. Relationship between the people and God, the creator and the creation. And that relationship has to be repaired. We broke God's heart in Eden, and ever since then is a story of covenants from Abraham to Noah to Moses, you know, up through time. The relationship needs to grow and change as people grow closer together or further apart. What happened with Zacchaeus and the idolatry of the kingdoms? A new beginning had to happen. 
And this is astounding. They're going to need a new covenant. And this is part of the reason why these books were controversial. That, particularly in Judaic experience, what's wrong with Moses? That he's no longer going to be relevant, or at least relevant in the same way. That we need a new covenant. That is mind-boggling. That we need something... We had Moses, we had Mount Sinai, we had all this, we had 40 years... You mean a new covenant? This is the hard truth that Jeremiah and Ezekiel will both preach. A new covenant. And so, in the Christian experience, both Ezekiel and Jeremiah here are laying the scriptural groundwork for Christ to appear and create this new covenant. But things will have to happen between then and the, and the incarnation of Christ. But it's established here. You're going to need a new covenant. And let me tell you about this new covenant. You're not going to understand because you understood nothing so far. But the word of God, hello, Christ, is speaking through him about what the new covenant will be like. Be prepared. It's going to be in your scriptures for you to find to know Christ when he comes. So reading now from Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming. That means not now, sometime in the future. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make, all future, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The house of Israel is gone now. But no, those people are seeded into the Gentiles now. Seeded in the sense of that promise through intermarriage to spread to all the Gentile nations, genetically, if you want to think of it that way, that God's going to make a covenant with the entire world. The house of Israel and the house of Judah, which is now interwoven through intermarriage with all the people of the world. And he's saying here, striking back against what people had thought about Moses as, as something fixed and permanent and unchanging. Here, verse 32, not according to the covenant I made with the fathers, with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. So he's announcing an end to the Mosaic covenant, the laws under Moses. Things are going to change with the new covenant. Moses still has moral authority, but the laws of Moses were never really about the, the laws as such. As I talked about in earlier lectures, that the idea of holiness was communicated by Moses in a very literal way because the people at that time, late Bronze Age, former slaves, had a hard time understanding holiness abstractly, metaphysically. So holiness became about physical purity as a way to kind of teach the people, oh, if I'm going to go before God, I'm going to have to be pure in my behavior and in my body. I shouldn't have been touching anything unclean. And it's kind of a teaching experience to try to teach about what holiness is through physical activities that hopefully convey a message of, oh, I want to be before the true source of life. Therefore, I should not have been in contact with death. So the literal has a teaching purpose in order to teach something about abstract holiness as an interior relationship to God who is abstract and transcendent. So here it's being announced in Jeremiah, the new covenant's not going to be like what Moses prescribed. Instead, God says, I will put my law in their minds and write it upon their hearts, not stone tablets. It's going to be different. It's going to be abstract. It's going to be moral. It's going to be spiritual. It's going to be part of the mental life of the people. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Familiar words in the Judea context. However, another change against Moses. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will give them, forgive them their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So this is going to be a final covenant 
that's going to repair the relationship fully. That's what Christ will do. But these middle words, no more shall every man uh, teach his neighbor. Remember the d discourse in the earlier lecture about the Shema, about uh, mezuzah on the door on the door and the prayer with the thing wrapped around your arm and you know these type of things it's like no 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 that's a teaching tool your prayer is going to be written on your heart and on your mind and you're not going to have to do these literal laws of moses because you're going to finally get what god has been driving at about what is holiness Cleanliness is next to holiness, but no, holiness is holiness. So Jeremiah is preaching, we're going to need a radical change about how we understand Judaism and the laws of Moses, and it's going to be different. This is incredibly radical, and his message doesn't end there. There's always going, there's going to be one additional promise I'm going to talk about on the next slide. So I'm recalling an earlier slide here and giving the information that comes afterwards. Jeremiah is going to preach that there's going to be a new Messiah that comes, but it's going to be different than what you expect. So first, the bottom verses, Jeremiah 23, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute the judgment and righteousness in the earth. The whole earth. And in his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel, Israel, that lost part, the tw ten tribes, will dwell safely. Now, this is the name by which he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. So he's predicting a new Messiah from the branch of David, but we know it's not going to be the type of messiah that they had in the past the anointed ones who are warrior kings it's not going to be that type so jeremiah is giving complicated messages here of have hope it's not going to be in these type of kings a new type of king is coming in fact his name will be called it's going to be the actual king of kings you're going to get this new messiah in the christian experience these verses come together and make sense it's entirely baffling in the judaic experiences uh, first you're saying you know there's going to be someone from the line of david who's not going to be ruling anymore in judah and then you're talking in this prophetic language that it's going to be sort of this everlasting peace of a kingdom king shall reign and prosper execute judgments and righteousness in the whole earth as days judah will be saved and israel shall dwell so safely and be the lords of righteousness? That is interesting. Now let's turn to Ezekiel in order to get uh, these complementary prophets, each adding something to this new prophecy about the new covenant. Each tells the story from a different perspective, one from the word of God, the other from the wisdom of God. Turning now to the prophet Ezekiel, his book is considered the most controversial, at least in, within Judaic circles, that his writings very overtly push back against the laws of Moses. And I'll get into exactly what he writes in a second. But the rabbis had a quite a decision to make. Is this book of Ezekiel truly inspired or is it heretical? Should it be rejected and suppressed? And it's said that the great rabbi Hania ben Hezekiah ben Geron, who lived during the time of Jesus, that in the first century of Palestine, it was given his task to consider this book and if it's something that can be included in the Hebrew canon or what would become the Hebrew canon. And the legend is that studying the book of Ezekiel, he went through 30 jars of lamp oil that he's up at night studying, you know, into the late hours, burning the oil of the lamp. And he went through 30 jars of lamp oil, studying very carefully Ezekiel and the Torah to see if it's okay. 
We don't know how long that time was. Does a jar of oil last a week? Does it last two days? It's apparent that 30 jars of oil is a considerable amount of time. In the end, he said, the book can be included in the Hebrew Bible, what would become the Hebrew Bible, under two conditions. Chapter 1 may never be read in synagogues, and, chap and secondly, that no person under the age of 30 may be permitted to read the book in private. It is that radical, it's that controversial. And it's assumed that if you're over 30, the more mature mind would be able to handle what the book would confront you with. So that's a testament to what we're about to approach, that things we saw in Jeremiah are much more overt in Ezekiel about the laws of Moses need to change and evolve and grow in a new direction. And what those are, let us visit in the next couple of slides. Non-Christians and atheists often criticize the Old Testament as being incredibly bloody, that uh, the God of Israel seems particularly vicious with collective punishment, destroying entire cities like Sodom and Gomorrah, and sending serpents to attack all the people in the Sinai, not just the sinners, but all people. The idea of collective punishment the prophet Ezekiel announces that time is over. Writing from the exile, the last act of God to, you know, to do something collectively was the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple of Solomon because it had become empty. It had become religiously meaningless because the people were practicing idolatry. Now Ezekiel says, now the rules are different. Reading now, Ezekiel 18. God says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul of who sins shall die. But if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he walks in my statutes and keeps my judgments faithfully, he is just and surely he shall live, says the Lord God. So God is only going to target the sinners in punishment and the faithful will be rewarded. So the idea of collective punishment has come to an end, according to the prophet Ezekiel. It's more than that. Let's turn to the next slide. The prophet Ezekiel also announces an end to intergenerational punishment after the exile, that the laws are now changing. Here's a verse from Moses, from the book of Deuteronomy, which announces that at that time, when Deuteronomy was, was read, that God, here quoting now, for I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So under Moses, the sins of the father would be visited upon, I mean, the children would be punished for the sins of the father to the third and fourth generations, you know, to the children, to the grandchildren, to the great-grandchildren, the great-great-grandchildren, all responsible for the sin of the original father. That was under Moses. Ezekiel says that has changed. Let's talk about it on the next slide. Moses said one thing, Ezekiel says a different thing. We understand now why the rabbis are worried about the book of Ezekiel. Here's what Ezekiel writes. The soul, the soul who sins shall die, but the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. The wickedness of the wicked shall be on himself. So this is a direct contradiction of the word of God that came to Moses and became the book of Deuteronomy. Now that has changed. And this is the significance of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. That the rules and the laws of God, there was only one law in Eden. 
do not eat of the tree and then there are only certain rules after Noah and it goes forward to Moses and now a new evolution in culture and history and now the people are ready for new sets of laws as I argued before that the laws of Moses are very literal but drive at abstract concepts such as holiness and the transcendence of the deity and so the laws of Moses were a teaching tool, a stepping stone. They weren't permanent and meant to exist throughout all times as you know, unalterable precepts of divine will. They were something for humanity to grow upon. And when humanity grows, something new would take its place. It's an evolutionary view of the word of God, if we can phrase it you know, in those terms. And this is what Ezekiel is saying. Things are different now. And continue with Ezekiel 33. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn away, turn from his way and live. It's talking about repentance. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? So God is going to create this new covenant that Jeremiah spoke about. And under this new covenant, new rules, no collective punishment, no intergenerational punishment. Now let's continue with examining Ezekiel. Writing from the time of exile in the Babylonian captivity, Ezekiel will at times speak about a return to the promised land as something very literal. We are going back to Palestine. We're going to go back to Jerusalem. For example, here in Ezekiel 28, thus says Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, that's talking about everyone, the North Kingdom too, and am hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob, and they shall dwell safely there, build houses and plant vineyards. Yes, they shall dwell securely when I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God. So the people are going back home after the exile, and this proved to be true. Queen Esther came upon the scene, and she was able to get her people released to go back home, and many of them did. But only sometimes does Ezekiel talk about the promised land as a place in their time and in their geography that they're familiar with. Let's turn to the next slide. Other times Ezekiel will talk about the promised land, not literally, not actually, not as something in their time and place, but mystically, something that may sound familiar to Christian ears because it's echoed in the book of Revelation. So quoting now from Ezekiel, in the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. It's a rapture. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me very high on a mountain. And on it, toward the south, was something like the structure of a city. Not a, not a city, but something like. He's using very allegorical language here, which we're going to get into. It's a vision, it's indistinct, and he recognizes it as something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze, and he had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. Who is this man? Well, Christian would say, okay, that's Christ, obviously, but for Jews of this time and for the Judaic experience, what is going on here? This is something very mystical, and it's obviously he's having this rapturous experience. He's raptured. He's taken by the God by the hand who set him very high on a mountain, and he looked and he gazed at something that he had a hard time recognizing. That's why it's something like what I beheld was something like the structure of a city. 
if it was an actual city, he says, I was high on a mountain and I saw the city of Jerusalem and ruins or whatever. But no, he saw something else. This is the heavenly Jerusalem. This is the kingdom of God itself. And there was a man who had an appearance of bronze, bronze as shining, as burnished, as holy, what we'd recognize as holy, like the, the glow that saints have. So there's something different here. No longer is this a literal city. This is something mystical. And Ezekiel will go on to redefine and reallocate the promised territories of each tribe of Israel in this new archetype of a heavenly Jerusalem that exists where tr the transcendent God will have to rapture you towards. So this is very interesting and why Ezekiel is controversial. He's having visions of a mystical sort that have nothing to do with the geography of ancient Jerusalem and Palestine. Ezekiel also tells us more about the sins of the kingdom of Judah that precipitated the need for God to say, I'm going to use a foreign nation to crush you because you have become an abomination before the Lord. And one of the things that apparently was being conducted was child sacrifice. And it's mentioned a couple of times in the Hebrew Bible and uh, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles and here in Ezekiel. Quoting now, moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to God, to me, and these you sacrificed them to be devoured. Were your, your acts of harlotry a small matter that you have slain my children and offered them, uh, offered them up to them by causing them to pass through the fire? They were burnt offerings. And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. That apparently in this strange form of religion that was embraced of in the kingdom of Judah, of idolatry and a little bit of Judaism, that somehow child sacrifice became something they thought God wanted. Obviously, God doesn't want it here. Ezekiel is talking about it. And as we recall in the book of Judges, when Jephthah sacrificed his own daughter, that wasn't God's idea. That was his own idea that he thought he had to do. There's no indication that God wanted his daughter's sacrifice. So child sacrifice is condemned. And Jeremiah 2 says, no, God does not want this. Yet the people were practicing this. Their idolatry was that horrific. Ezekiel is also known for what is called enacted prophecy or dramatic ministry. We saw in the case of Jeremiah, you know, he took the very literal action of, I'm going to buy property. I'm going to get the deed to the property. I'm going to put it in a jar. I'm going to bury it in the ground because we're coming back. So it's adding a physical action to accompany the import of his words. There's an extra teaching tool recorded in there, you know, that he did this physical demonstration to punctuate the words coming out of his mouth. Ezekiel does this and more. He does a lot of enacted prophecy. He acts out activities that are meant to shock the people and wake them up to repentance. Uh, he creates a clay model of the city of Jerusalem. At another point, he lies on his left side for 390 days and his right side for 40 days to symbolize the years of punishment on Judah. And in a most striking instance, he eats defiled bread cooked over human dung as a way to symbolize the starvation of the Israelites during the siege. So he's really flaunting the purity laws, you know, of Moses here. You don't cook over human dung. That's obviously not clean. But he's doing this in order to convey certain messages and to enact certain realities. And the text says that the, the Israelites during siege is a time of starvation. And so he was living out that reality, continuing in exile to remind the people of where they came from. At one point, he digs through a wall, 
while dragging behind himself his own baggage as a way to symbolize the inescapable reality of judgment even though you may flee to egypt or flee or be taken against your will to babylon you're taking with you god's judgment upon yourself and perhaps the most tragic of all he loses his own wife in death which the text indicates is symbolizing how the chosen people are lost in Yahweh's eyes. Covenant is often expressed in the language of matrimony, of marriage. And just as Ezekiel lost his wife, that the relationship between the chosen people and God has also ended and will have to be reborn in a new way, in the new covenant that Jeremiah talked about. And so he's reminding the people of exile, remember how you got here? Remember what it was like under siege? No matter what you do, you're still dragging behind yourself all this baggage, kind of using the modern language, you know, you know, your emotional baggage. Well, here it's spiritual baggage. They're dragging around with them about judgment. And what has happened to the J people? He's outlining this. Now let's go on to other interesting aspects of this book. Here Ezekiel describes or tries to describe the theophanies that he had of beholding the full divine presence of the Lord. Now, orthodoxy describes the Lord as ineffable, which means indescribable, which means an awe-inspiring manifestation that is beyond our ability cognitively to perceive or understand. It's like the eighth color of the rainbow. If you ever saw an eighth color, how would you describe it? You would have to describe it in relationship to something else. It is like this, but like that, often using contradictory language because there's nothing in our reality that exactly matches the eighth color of the rainbow. So similarly, Ezekiel here beholds the fullness of God and what he saw just boggled the mind. And in trying to describe what he saw, he has to use analogy to things that reminded him in one way of something like what he actually beheld. So Ezekiel 1, verses 4 through 9, quoting him, Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, and a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself. And brightness was all about it, and radi radiating out of its mists, like the color of amber. So once it's fire, but now it's something else, the color of amber. So obviously this is this language of trying to describe the indescribable in contradictory terms because he's focusing on different parts at different times. Out of the mist of fire. Also within it came the likeness of four living creatures. Again, that language, something like the likeness. He says it's not exactly that, but if he had to put in a word, it was something like the likeness of four living creatures. And this is where there was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces already, not like a man at all. So like a man, but not. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight and the soles of the feet were like the soles of calves feet. Not literally, but something of their appearance reminded him of that. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Very confusing appearance that his mind was trying to grasp, and it came up with almost absurd images of what is this like the eighth color, and he's struggling to describe it. Their wings touched one another, and the creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. And so this impossible vision of the glory of God and his mind just goggled at it. And trying to put it in words were things that came to mind. And it was kind of like this, and it was kind of like that, but it was also had this amber, but yet it was also like bronze. And it had wings, it was like a man, but not... And so it's the ineffable, it's reality of God before the creaturely mind, which cannot comprehend it. It's one of the most amazing parts of the book of Ezekiel.
So why does Ezekiel go to great lengths to describe this impossible theophany of God? It is leading up to this, that what he is describing is the Holy of Holies, which is just the throne room for God. But here is the true God that exists in the Holy of Holies. And it is a chariot of fire. It is able to move. It departs from the temple. That God was not tied to the temple of Solomon. It may have resided there, but the true God wanders freely the entire creation because this is not a God of Israel. It's a God of the entire world. And so here he returns to this theophany and sees now that it's moving beyond the temple of Solomon, that this is not destroyed. Only the building was destroyed. The true glory of God exists wherever God chooses to exist. And look, and I looked, and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there was a light, there, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance and likeness of a throne. Then he spoke to the man clothed with linen and said, Go in, go in among the wheels under the cherub and fill your hands with the coals of fire from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in as I watched. Now the cherubim was standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. This is the glory of God. And the glory of God is going to, it's like, what happened to Jerusalem was God's will because the people had a very small conception of God. This God and this chariot of fire exists throughout the world as mobile can move, is not tired to a particular space and geographic location. And so this is the what uh, later uh, Judaic tradition would call the Shekinah, the presence of the Lord. And it's not tied to the temple you know, or to the city of Jerusalem, but for the entire world. Both Jeremiah and Ezekiel spoke to an end, to a fulfillment of the laws of Moses, such that a new covenant and new understandings of God have to emerge after the exile. In many ways, Ezekiel and Jeremiah set the stage for Christ to enter into the world because now the scriptural foundations are set. It's no longer about the laws of Moses. There's going to be a new covenant and this new covenant will de do away with sin altogether. No longer will there be collective punishment but individual responsibility. And God is not going to be tied to a physical city of Jerusalem God exists throughout the world, and you're supposed to wait at some point in the future for this heavenly city, this heavenly Jerusalem, to come. Now, a question that arises, that the Jews returned in 538, but Christ would only appear 538 years later. Why the delay if those that groundwork was set? I would argue, and I mentioned this earlier, is that something else needed to happen. Not only are there gonna be other prophets we're gonna look at that have to preach and each having their own particular messages, and you should know about Isaiah and about the suffering servant that Christ, how he would have to establish his covenant. So there's still that, but in addition, I would say that if God worked through Nebuchadnezzar in order to achieve what he wanted to achieve, with the destruction of the southern kingdom temporarily in order for the people to have a teaching moment about the true reality of God and the true consequences of idolatry before they could return, that if Nebuchadnezzar served God purposes, I think also Alexander the Great did as well. And so this is why I'm turning back to this slide, the Hellenistic period. I think this is a very important point of history in the redemption story of the world, that much would be added to, to Judaic culture through Alexander the Great, who allowed Greek culture, Greek language, and Greek philosophy to fill the Judaic experience, such that rabbis of this time and up to Philo of Alexandria in the time of Jesus 
would all look toward the Torah and to the books of the Hebrew canon with a philosophical eye in order to try to find the abstract behind the literal. And that's what you need to understand prophecy. And so I think Alexander the Great really fits into the story, and that's maybe why you know, you needed a good uh, two and a half centuries of Greek Hellenistic culture within Judaism. So when Christ returned, some people would listen to him. Very few people listened to Jeremiah and Ezekiel in their time. And Christ, his following started small but grew. But that was the first time in history, arguably, where his seed could take root into Hellenistic culture, where Christ would be called the Logos, a Greek philosophical word, and that people would hear that, including Greeks in Athens listening to Paul, some of them converted, that everything starts coming together. So why so long for Christ to appear? Well, you had to have Moses, and you had to have King David, and you had to have King Solomon in the great times. Then that literal message of the Promised Land had to be lost because people forgot God. It became fables and abstract to them, and they lost themselves in the politics of the day. And so God had to like sweep it clean with, um, with Nebuchadnezzar and have a Babylonian captivity. And once people returned, that would be replaced by Hellenistic culture and the society would grow and change. And that set the stage for Christ to return during the Roman period and have some people listen to him. And from there, grow into the great church that we know today. So I see history and salvation history working together. And I would suggest this is God's plan of working with people and trying to teach the student when the student's ready, you know, through different epochs of time, from the late Bronze Age to the early Iron Age, up until the beginning of modern times, the first century AD. So we'll continue the discussion next week when we talk about Isaiah and Esther as we continue through our course.